Good morning and happy Friday. Welcome back to Kivley Kids Cozy Corner. I can't believe it's Friday already. Oh my gosh, this week went by fast. Um, we finished James and the Giant Peach yesterday. Yee! Told you it was gonna be cliffhanger. We're gonna do the Pledge and the Motto first. Then I'll tell you what we're reading, although you might be able to see it right here. I'm gonna move it out of the way a little bit. Here we go. <clears throat> Salute and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all and here we go again most of my shields kiddos at this point have this memorized and maybe some of you who aren't our shields kids have this memorized we are students at peter j shields we believe in kindness we are responsible we are persistent we are respectful we are bucket fillers we drop acts of kindness into everything we do we are peter j shields <clears throat> so kiddos your challenge for this weekend is to be that bucket filler. Try to find someone that, um, you know, just needs a compliment or you just want to say hi to or, or wave to a neighbor from your porch. Um, leave a little thank you note for if you're getting things delivered. Like I've gotten some things delivered through Amazon and whatnot. So try to just do a little something kind that keeps us socially distanced still and think through this. So ready, drum roll. What is Miss Kibley reading? I'm going back to what I originally thought I would read, um, in part because I feel like less kiddos are familiar with this story. Um, and boy, talk about outrageous characters. If you thought Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were bad, holy moly, wait till you hear about the Trunchbull. Oh my gosh. Anyway, Matilda is what we're reading, yay. If you look at this book, um, you cannot see it, but I have put so much tape, you can hear it. I put so much tape on the outside to keep the cover that way. I taped it on the inside, it's totally falling apart. This will probably be the last reading that I can read uh, from this book. I did the same thing with the James and the Giant Peach. That's my second copy also. And this is my second copy of Matilda, so I've read this one a ton. Um, so anyway, I love this story. I love the fact that Matilda's like ridiculously smart. Um, she kind of reminds me if you watched, ever watched a show called Big Bang Theory and Sheldon, but yet she is a super kind, super sweet kiddo. And um, it's just amazing. And this was written back in 1988, so still um, a while ago, but a, another great raw doll story. So let's start by reading Matilda and see how far we get today for our Cliffhanger Friday. So there, Cliffhanger's over. Hopefully you're not checking out now since the Cliffhanger's over. But let's go through this and see how we do the first chapter so these chapters aren't numbered the other one had numbers and no titles these ones have titles and no numbers so here we are the reader of books is this first ch chapter title it's a funny thing about mothers and fathers even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister that you could ever imagine they still think that he or she is wonderful some parents go further they become so blinded by adoration that they manage to convince themselves that their child has the qualities of a genius. Well, there is nothing very wrong with all of this. It's the way of the world. It's only when parents begin telling us about the brilliance of their own revolting offspring that we start shouting, bring us the basin, we're gonna be sick. So the basin, the sink, uh. Oh, my pages are falling out, yikes. School teachers suffer a good deal from having to listen to this sort of twaddle from pair out parents, but they usually get their own back when the time comes to write the end of term reports. So again, remember he is um, Norwegian, but raised in uh, England. So end of term reports, report cards is what we call them here in the US more. So just hang in there, you get it. If I were a teacher, I would cook up some real scorchers for the children of doting parents. Your son Maximilian, I would write, is a total washout. I hope you have a family business you can push him into when he leaves school because he sure as heck won't find a job anywhere else. Or if I were feeling lyrical that day, I might write, it is a curious truth that grasshoppers have their hearing organs on the side of their abdomen. Your daughter, Vanessa, judging by what she's learned this term, has no hearing organs at all. So that means she's naughty good. I know you guys are going, oh, listener. I might delve even deeper into the natural history and say, the periodical cicada 
spent six years as a grub underground and no more than six days as a free creature of sunlight and air. Your son Wilford has spent six years as a grub in this school and we are still waiting for him to emerge from his chrysalis. Uh, or a particular poisonous little girl might sting me into saying, Fiona has the same glacial beauty as an iceberg, but unlike the iceberg, she has absolutely nothing below the surface. <laughs> so I like these creativity. So think about an iceberg, nothing below the surface, not to, not showing anyway, the brightness. I think I might enjoy writing end to term reports for the little stinkers in my class, but enough of that, we have to get on. So I just like his little humor. You can tell that he has a good sense of humor. Occasionally one comes across parents who take the opposite line, who show no interest at all in their children. And these of course are far worse than the doting ones. Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were two such parents. Now I'm gonna tell you, I've been teaching for 24 years. I have never, ever dealt with parents such as this. They had a son called Michael and a daughter called Matilda. Matilda. And the parents looked upon Matilda in particular as nothing more than a scab. The scab is something you have to put up with until the time comes when you can pick it off and flick it away. Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood looked forward enormously to the time when they could pick up their little daughter and flick her away, preferably to the next county or even further than that. It was bad enough when parents treat ordinary children as though they were scabs and bunions, but it becomes somehow a lot worse when the child is questioned, in question is extraordinary. And by this, I mean sensitive and brilliant. So a lot of times those two things don't go together, but she's sensitive and brilliant. Matilda was both of these things, but above all, she was brilliant. Her mind was so nimble and she was so quick to learn that her ability should have been obvious even to the most half-witted of parents. But Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were both formless and so wrapped up in their own silly lives that they failed to notice anything unusual about their daughter. To tell the truth, I doubt they would have noticed if she had crawled into the house with a broken leg. Matilda's brother, Michael, was perfectly normal boy, but the sister, as I said, was something to make your eyes pump. By the age of one and a half, her speech was perfect, and she knew as many words as most grown-ups. The parents, instead of applauding her, called her a noisy chatterbox and told her sharply that small girls should be seen and not heard. By the time she was three, Matilda had taught herself to read by studying newspapers and magazines that lay around the house. At the age of four, she could read fast and well, so she naturally began hankering after books. The only book in the whole of this enlightened household was something called Easy Cooking, belonging to her mother. And when she had read it from cover to cover, she had learned all the recipes by heart. So she decided she wanted to read something more interesting. Daddy, she asked, do you think you could buy me a book? A book, he said. What do you flaming want a book for? Well, to read, Daddy. What's wrong with the telly, for heaven's sakes? We've got a lovely telly, 12 inch screen. And now you come asking for a book? Ugh, you're getting spoiled, my dear. So again, 1988, not big screen TVs like we have today, 12 inch telly. So the television was still fairly new. Nearly every weekday afternoon, Matilda was left alone in the house. Her brother, five years older than her, went to school. Her father went to work and her mother went out playing bingo in a town eight miles away. Mrs. Wormwood was hooked on bingo and played it five afternoons a week. On the afternoon of the day when her father had refused to buy her a book, Matilda set out all by herself to walk to the public library in the village. When she arrived, she introduced herself to the librarian, Mrs. Phelps. She asked if she might sit a while and read a book. Mrs. Phelps, slightly taken aback at the arrival of such a tiny girl unaccompanied by a parent, nevertheless, she told her You're, she was welcome. Where are the children's books, please? Matilda asked. They are over there on the lower shelves, Mrs. Phelps told her. Would you like me to help find a nice one with lots of pictures in it? No, thank you, Matilda said. I'm sure I can manage. So remember, she's how old? Four, four, four. From then on, every afternoon, as soon as her mother left for bingo, Matilda would toddle down to the library. The walk took only 10 minutes, and this allowed her two glorious hours of sitting quietly by herself in a cozy corner. Hmm, Kelly Kid's cozy corner. There we go. In a cozy corner, devouring one book after another. When she read every single children's book in the place, she started wandering about for something else. Mrs. Phelps, who had been watching her with fascination for the past few weeks, now got up from her desk and went over to her. 
Can I help you, Matilda? She asked. I'm wondering what to read next, Matilda said. I finished all the children's books. You mean you've looked at all the pictures? Well, yeah, but I read the books as well. Mrs. Phelps looked down at Matilda from her great height and Matilda looked right back up at her. I thought some were very poor, Matilda said, but others were quite lovely. I liked the secret garden best of all. It was full of mystery. The mystery of the room behind the closed doors and the mystery of the garden behind the big wall. Mrs. Phelps was stunned. Exactly how old are you, Matilda, she asked. Four years and three months, Matilda said. Mrs. Phelps was more stunned than ever. Um, but she did have the sense not to show it. Well, what sort of book would you like to read next, she asked. Matilda said, I would like a really good one that grown-ups read. A famous one, but I don't know any names. Mrs. Phelps looked along the shelves, taking her time. She didn't quite know what to bring out. How, she asked herself, does one choose a famous grown-up book for a four-year-old girl? Her first thought was to pick a young teenager's romance, the kind that was written for 15-year-old schoolgirls. But for some reason, she found herself instinctively walking past that particular shelf. Try this, she said at last. It's very famous and very good. If it's too long for you, just let me know and I'll find something shorter and a bit easier. Great Expectations, Matilda read, by Charles Dickens. I'd love to try it. I must be mad, Mrs. Phelps told herself. But to Matilda, she said, of course you may try it. Over the next few afternoons, Mrs. Phelps could hardly take her eyes off the small girl sitting an hour after hour in a big armchair at the far end of the room with a book on her lap. It was necessary to rest it on her lap because it was too heavy for her to hold up, which meant she had to sit forward in order to read the book. And a strange sight this was for a tiny dark haired person sitting there, <clears throat> excuse me, with her feet nowhere touching, near touching the floor, totally absorbed in the wonderful adventures of Pip and old Miss Havisham and her cobwebbed house. And by the spell of the magic that Dickens, the great storyteller had woven into his words, the only movement from the reader was lifting of the hand every now and then to turn the page over. And Mrs. Phelps always felt sad when the time came for her to cross the floor and say, it's 10 to five, Matilda. During the first week of Matilda's visits, Mrs. Phelps said to her, does your mother walk you down here every day and then take you home? My mother goes to Islesbury every afternoon to play bingo, Matilda said. She doesn't know I come here. But that's surely not right, Mrs. Phelps said. I think you'd better ask her. Mm -hmm. I'd rather not. Matilda said, she doesn't encourage the reading of books, nor does my father. But what do they expect you to do every afternoon in an empty house? Oh, just mooch around and watch the telly. I see. She doesn't really care what I do, Matilda said, a little sadly. Mrs. Phelps was concerned about the child's safety on the walk through the fairly busy village, High Street, and the crossing of the road, but she decided not to interfere. Within a week, Matilda had finished Great Expectations which in that edition contained 411 pages. Okay, this one is like 200 and something, 240. So 411, holy cow. Oh, I love it, she said to Mrs. Phelps. Has Mr. Dickens written any others? Oh, great number, said the astonished Mrs. Phelps. Shall I choose you another? Over the next six months, under Mrs. Phelps' watchful, compassionate eye, Matilda read the following books. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Jane Eyre by Emily Bronte, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy, Gone to Earth by Mary Webb, Kim by Rudyard Kipling, The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells, The Old Man in the Sea, Ernest Hemingway, The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck, The Good Companions by J.B. Priestley, Brighton Rock by Graham Greene, and Animal Farm by George Orwell. It was a formidable list, and now Mrs. Phelps was filled with wonder and excitement, but it was probably a good thing that she did not allow herself to be completely carried away by it all. Almost anyone else witnessing the achievements of this small child would have been tempted. <clears throat> Excuse me. I lost my place. Up to make a great fuss and shout the news all over the village and beyond, but not, but not so Mrs. Phelps. She was someone who minded her own business had long discovered it was seldom worth a while to interfere with other people's children. Mr. Hemingway says a lot of things I don't understand, Matilda said to her, especially about men and women, but I loved it all the same. The way he tells it, I feel like I'm right there on the spot watching it all happen. And that, my friends, is where we have to leave off today. I hope you have a great weekend and we'll continue with Matilda on Monday. Bye, be safe. We love you and care about you and we can't wait to see you again. Bye-bye.